Micah chapter number 6, Micah chapter 6, and um, that song they sang was a prayer as well. I told you the first song we sang was a prayer, and, and praying is really what's on my heart for us to do tonight. Um, I preached Sunday morning about um, the touch of God. I don't know, if, uh, surely y'all remember at least that, right? I preached Sunday morning on the touch of God, Luke chapter 6, where those multitudes, they sought to touch him, right, because virtue went out of him and healed them all. And, and I was talking about that, the touch of God and how much we need the touch of God. They were, they were searching for a touch and they sacrificed for a touch and they were saved by His touch and they were strengthened by His touch and all those things. And we talked about how much we need the touch of God, right? How much we need to draw close to God. And basically I was urging the church and pleading with the church to have a holy desire for God's touch in our life. And that's not just when we come to church. I'm talking about a holy desire for God's touch every single day. Uh, at every moment of every day, we live with a constant burning desire for the touch of God. And, and if you're touching something, again, I told you the definition of touch it is to come in contact with. Uh, and that is, if you live with the touch of God in your life, that is staying in constant contact with Him, right? That's what a touch is. It's contact. And so when you and I stray away from God and there's distance... Uh, then, then we don't have the touch, right? And, and we talked about how important it is that we walk in the Spirit uh, and we live a life of prayer and all those different things. And I think that, that the heart that I was really wanting to impress upon your heart and my hearts is well described in these verses. You're in Micah 6, stay there. But Philippians 3, Paul says this. He says, What things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things but lost, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Do you see the urgency and the passion in the Apostle Paul's voice uh, as he writes those words? He says, this entire world, I count it all loss, it's all just dung, the only thing I'm interested in is Christ. I want to win Christ, I want to be near Him, I want to draw close to Him. And, and there are so many things that can get between us and Christ. Anything between you and Christ is an obstacle. Anything between you and Christ is something that ought to be sacrificed. And there are good things that get between us and Christ. Sometimes your family can get between you and Christ, right? Uh, sometimes, you know, a love of wealth or hobbies or pride, what, whatever the thing is, if it's between you and Christ, it's not so much important what it is, but where it is. It's between you and Christ. That's the problem, right? I mean, there, there's, there's an order for things. There should be priorities in our life. You are, you're supposed to love your family. You're supposed to take care of your family, work a job, all those kinds of things, pay your bills. That's absolutely all right. But if it gets between us and God, it's a problem. doesn't matter what it is, who it is, right? And so that's what we were talking about is having just a, a desire to get close enough to God, to draw near to Him, and, and to experience His touch in our lives. And, and while I was meditating on that and thinking about that, even after... Uh, preaching it Sunday morning, this, these verses came to my mind. That's what I want for us to look at tonight. It's kind of, you could almost think of it as a part two to, to what we preached on Sunday morning. Let's look in Micah chapter number six, and we'll begin reading in verse number six. Micah six and verse six. The Bible says, Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be, pre be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. Sunday morning we'll be starting a revival meeting in, in the church. And churches have different kinds of meetings for different reasons. All right, People have Bible conferences. And, and that is to educate the saints in the church. Right? Churches will hold tent meetings. And those are normally uh, evangelistic crusades. Right? You're trying to get sinners in there to hear the gospel. And people have jubilee meetings right? to try to be a blessing and encourage other people who are in the ministry. Revival meetings are held for this purpose. It is to stir up the local church and to help us all draw near to God. That's why we have the revival meetings. It's to try to stir us up 
it, to, to wake us up, if you will, right? Uh, and again, there's so many times, I mentioned earlier, we, we get in a rut about things, and we just start going through the motions, and, and we lose the passion, and we lose the zeal, and the urgency for our spiritual life. And a revival meeting is, is something that we do that is out of the ordinary. You're, you're coming to church on nights. You normally wouldn't come to church. Uh, you know, you're having to make arrangements for that. And what that is is a sacrifice, but it's a sacrifice to draw near to God. And God blesses that. Amen? Any step that you take in God's direction, I don't care if it's the baby step. I don't care if it's just the slightest glance in His direction. When your heart is moving toward Him, He is moving towards you. He responds to us attempting to seek Him, right? Uh, when we seek Him, we shall find Him, right? And so we got to be looking for a touch from God. we got to be looking to draw nigh to God. And that's what this text asks at the beginning of verse number 6. It asks this question. Verse number 6, Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? That's a great question. It's a great question, right? What he's saying is, How can mortal man draw close to a holy God? We're talking, about a, we're talking about a big gap between sinful man and thrice holy God. Uh, that, that, that's, that's a big gap. And the question is, how can, can, can man attempt to draw nigh to God? Uh, I mean, he, he's holy, right? He's, he's in a place where you and I uh, cannot hope to attain to on our own. Isaiah 57, talking about the habitation of God, it says, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place. So God dwells in a high and holy place. You and I are in a low sinful world. And, and how in the world can we bridge the gap? How, how can you and I draw nigh to God? Sunday morning we were talking about an urgency to draw nigh and having a desire to draw nigh. But what we find in these verses is an answer, very practically speaking, as to how to draw nigh to God. How you and I can approach God, how we can, uh, how we can accomplish that desire or experience the desire of our heart to draw near to the Lord. He asks this question, on what grounds can we approach Him? That's what it means with the first word of verse number 6 is wherewith. Wherewith. If you look that up in a dictionary today, it'll tell you that's archaic and you shouldn't use that word. Uh, I like the word wherewith. It, it literally just means with what. Okay? When he says wherewith shall I come before the Lord, he's, he's saying with what should I come before the Lord? Or basically he's saying, surely I can't come empty-handed. Surely if I'm, if I'm going to approach God, wherewith? Or, or what do I need to bring with me to approach God? He's basically asking, what's the entry fee to approach God? What, what, it, what are the requirements? What is God looking for when we approach Him? Or, and, and how that we try to approach God? And what we'll see in these verses tonight, we'll see two things. First of all, we'll see man's misconceptions about approaching God. That's verse 6 and 7. And then in verse 8, we'll see Micah's mandates for approaching God. Or this, this is the way that you do it. Amen? So that's what I, want to, what I want to preach on tonight. What God requires. What God requires. First of all, man's misconceptions. In verse number 6 and 7, um, people... Uh, well, let's read it one more time. Verse number 6 says, Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? He says this, Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? People have a lot of ideas and assumptions about what God is looking for. right? That's why there's so many different religions in the world. Each religion is, is, is presenting this different thing that, that in their mind God requires and God is looking for this, this different, uh, that basically different requirements. And, and the first misconception that he begins with is that God requires a bribe. That God requires bribes. That's hard to say. God requires bribes. But that's what he says in verse 6. He says, Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams? or with ten thousands of rivers of oil. Basically, the question is, can God be bought? Or can I, can, I, can I give enough money? When he's talking about rivers of oil, he's talking about calves of a year old, that, that was currency to them, right? I mean, that, that was a picture of their wealth. 
That, that was what they had amassed and what they had attained in the world. And what he's saying is, well, surely I'm going to have to pay my way to gain access to God. There are a whole lot of religions that will tell you that. You've got to buy your way. You've got to, you, buy, you better be in the good graces of the church. God's gonna, we're going to check your tithing records to make sure that you get to go to heaven. I mean, there are people who have all kinds of crazy ideas about the expense that must be paid in order to keep a right standing with God. And I said this last Wednesday night, uh, but, but God doesn't need your money. You do know that, right? God does not need your money. God's not up there in heaven looking for a loan, right? I mean, He, 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 he doesn't need a credit score. He, he's God, okay? Uh, I mean, he doesn't need money from you or me or anybody. He doesn't, that, and because of that, he cannot be bought. Psalm 50, uh, he says in Psalm 50, I will not reprove thee for thy sacrifices or thy burnt offerings to have been continually before me. I will take no bullock out of thy house, nor he goats out of thy folds, for every beast of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I love this verse, if I were hungry, I would not tell thee. For the world is mine and the fullness thereof. Will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of, of goats? What he's saying is, everything that you have that you would attempt to bribe me with belongs to me. All the money in your bank account Everything you got in your 401k, the, the, the equity in your house, I mean, the car that you drove up in tonight, God already owns that. It belongs to Him. You say, no, that's mine. You better watch out. He can take it when He wants to. Amen? Sometimes I think God will go around taking things just to show how much authority He has over the things that we think belong to us. And this man is thinking, well, I wonder if I can take what I have and then I can give it to God so He can have it. God already has it. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. All of the beasts of the forest are his. I mean, this whole world belongs to him and the fullness thereof. That means he, he, he owns the land. He owns everything on the land. The fullness of the earth belongs to God. And so how foolish it is to think that you and I could bribe him and somehow we could purchase favor with God. There are a lot of people who think that. That, that, by, that by giving money to a church, that, 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 just, that just automatically means they're right with God. That is not the case. Amen? That is not the case. I said last week, you can keep your money. And some people made like real big eyes. Some of y'all got excited and said, hey, I can keep it. You know? but, but, but the point is, God doesn't need it. I don't give money because I'm buying favor with God. This isn't the Catholic Church. We're not selling indulgences. I give because I love Him and I want to. I give out of a heart of thankfulness, right? I give thankfully. I, I, I give because God's blessed me and He's been good to me and I want to. Not because I'm trying to purchase favor. Not because I'm trying to bribe him with anything. It doesn't make sense to bribe him with what already belongs to him. Does that, not, does that make sense? So, so I'm not giving to be spared of a curse or to purchase a pardon. I'm giving because I love him and I want to. Uh, so that, that's a misconception people have is that I can bribe God into doing what I want him to do or, or, or giving me favor. The second misconception is that God requires blood. Verse number 7 it says, will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Watch this. Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? This was an extremely common practice during this period of time. You, you read the Old Testament, you see people who are taking their children and, and casting them into the fire. Right? Right? The Bible's full of that. People sacrificing their kids, ca causing them to pass through the fire. The human sacrifice. That's what he's talking about. Does God require blood? Or is, is God, and there are people who have this idea of God that he is some kind of bloodthirsty tyrant with just this, this desire for blood, and if blood is not shed, then he, his wrath will not be appeased, and, and he, he's going to be angry with us. Listen, that, that, that's what happened. Y'all remember on, the Mount, on Mount Carmel, right? When all those prophets of Baal are there with Elijah and they're trying, they're praying, trying to call down fire and what do they do? They start cutting themselves, right? Self-harm is demonic. It is satanic. The thief cometh not but for to kill and to steal and to destroy. Anytime you see someone who is trying to destroy human life, you know that is not of God. Right? 
That's why you and I are, are, are against that kind of thing. People cutting on themselves and tattoos and all these uh, extravagant piercings and all these things, they're all a symptom. It's all the same thing. It is self-harm. It's because the devil hates you. Right? You were created in the image of God. And because you're created in the image of God, Satan hates you. And Satan wants to mar the image of God in your life. And that's why he will, he will try to cause you to harm yourself and to harm others. By the way, this is still taking place today in abortion. Our country kills over 800,000 babies a year. Shall I give my firstborn the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? There are people who are literally offering their children and they're offering it to their God. Now a lot of times their God is them. Their God is convenience. So mostly, that's what most of all these abortions are. People who, who, who wanted to, to do what they shouldn't have been doing and then they don't want to pay the consequences that come with their actions and they take it out on an innocent, helpless child. That is satanic. That child, that person offered that child to Satan. Now greater is he that's in us, amen. We know what happens to all them babies. We praise God for that. They're in heaven right now. We're going to see them all again one day. But, but, but in this passage of Scripture, this person is literally saying, should I offer my firstborn? Should I offer my, the, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? You see how selfish that is? I'm going to give the fruit of my body, but not my body. Somebody else's, I'm going to give somebody else's body for the sin of my soul. This is just convoluted, but this is, the, the religions of this world advocate for this kind of stuff. Amen? Still happens. You go into some of these other countries, that, that's, why, that's why a Muslim could strap a bomb to the, to the chest of their child. The fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. I, I'm willing to sacrifice my child in order to earn favor with Allah. It's satanic. Right? It's It's wicked. It's a, it, a mis, the word misconception, that's an understatement to, to describe what this is talking about. And it shows that they don't, they don't know who God is. Because they wouldn't expect God to receive these things if they really knew who He was. So we see there are misconceptions about approaching God and what God requires. Secondly, I want to see, lastly, I want to see Micah's mandates. Or this, is, this is what God requires. Listen, this is what our church needs to do. This is what you need to do, what I need to do, alright? Verse number 8 says, He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. When he says, but what doth the Lord require, what he's saying is, there's nothing else that God wants from you. Those three things. To do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly. That's what God requires of us. And I know this is Old Testament. I understand the context of this passage of Scripture, but I do want to make this, this quick application. Do you understand why God doesn't want the fruit of our body for the sin of our soul? Because He already gave His Son for the sin of our soul. Amen? His Son shed His blood. Jesus Christ shed His blood for you and I to be saved. That's why we don't have to offer up our children. We can trust in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And, and, and only through His blood can you and I approach Him. Can we approach God? That's how you bridge the gap between sinful man and thrice holy God. It's the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you and I get saved, His blood washes our sins away. And then we're justified. We're given the righteousness of Christ. And we stand complete in Him. In Christ. Apart from Him, we're lost. We have no, no possibility of approaching God. But in the Lord Jesus Christ, we can approach Him. Amen. We can have a relationship with Him. Jesus said that no man cometh unto the Father but by Me. And so we see these three requirements. These three things that God says, I, I, I want these things... This is how you'll approach me. The first one is to do justly. Do justly. That would, you, could, you could think about that in a few different ways. You could think, first of all, it is to give all their dues. Right? To do justly means that you, you do what is right. You perform. Listen, you perform what justice would require. Okay? 
You perform what justice would require. And this is a broad statement. I can't think of many verses that are more broad than this one. Do justly. What does he say? Do right. Do right. You say, that's very broad. Yeah, it's supposed to be. It's, it needs to be broad enough to encompass every area of our lives. Because that's what he's asking for. He's asking for us to do right, to do justly in every area of our lives. James chapter 4, verse 17, another very broad verse. It says a very similar thing. It says, Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. To him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. That, that, that's doing justly is knowing to do good and doing it. And this is not deep, this is not difficult to understand, but it, but it is difficult to live. Right? Because, because it, is, it, is, it is supposed to be a guiding principle for our life. In business, at home, at church, in our thought life, in our marriages, in, in, in raising our children. I mean, in, in, in every area, on the job, out in this world, do right. Do justly. Do what, what justice would require. It encompasses all of our actions. And what this is saying is, it is meaning that we should expect ourselves. When he says do justly, he's saying that you should have an expectation that you could, will conform yourself to the laws of God. You know how you and I know what is right and what is just? It's what the Bible says. Right? Do justly. Do right. Well, how do I know what's right? The Bible. It tells us what's right. It tells us what's right and wrong. We, we have the law of God. We, we, we know what God wants us to do. Listen, you, you and I are not going to be able to plead ignorance. When we stand at the judgment seat of Christ, we're not going to be able to plead ignorance and say, well, it, I just didn't know. That's not our problem. It's not that we know. It's that we know, but we don't do. So it's saying that you and I, think about this with me. It's saying when he says do justly, he's saying you and I should have expectations of ourselves that we're going to conform to the laws of God. We're going to have demands upon ourselves. Demand that which is right from ourselves. Do you think so little of yourself that you, that you think you could not produce justice? You could not do that which is right and that you should expect nothing from yourself at all. Listen, I, I think we should have, have a high, high estimation for what personal holiness is supposed to look like. That, listen, most churches have lost that completely. This whole concept of holiness. The Bible says to be ye holy for I am holy. That is a command, right? Be ye holy for I am holy. And what we've done is we, we want to make excuses. I know it's loud. Just turn me up if you have to. We, we want to make excuses for everything and, and, and say, well, you know, I'm, I'm just a man. Well, yeah, but, but you're filled with the Holy Ghost. You've been given a Holy Bible. You, you have the privilege of prayer. I mean, God has equipped us to do what He's asked us to do and what He's told us to do. And that is to do justly. There are people who they don't even try to do justly because we, we act as if it's something that's unattainable. No, if the Bible tells us to do it, we can do it. Amen? You can turn me down a little, Noah. Now, now Noah's going to have to turn me up and down as the rain comes. But, but doing justly, because it's commanded, that means it's within our capacity. Right? Amen? He tells us to do justly. And when he tells them earlier, he says, uh, He hath showed thee, look at the very verse, first part of verse number 8. He says, He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what the Lord doth require of thee. What he's saying is, hey, I've already told you. You, you shouldn't be asking this question. I've already told you. He has shown you what's good and what the Lord requires. Deuteronomy 10 verse 12 says, And now Israel, walk, or what doth the Lord thy God require of thee? But to fear the Lord thy God, and to walk in His ways, and to love Him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. They knew what to do. They just weren't doing it. They didn't choose to live right and to do right by others. 
And, and doing justly, again, I, I know this is broad, and I'm, I'm not going to try to belabor the point, but doing justly would mean that you should do right by your family. It means that you should do right by, by your coworkers. You should do right by your employer. Right? I remember one day I was working over there at Dollar General Distribution Center, and one, after, one, one, one evening or one afternoon I'm standing over there, and we had to wait until a certain time to clock out. And there was a bunch of us guys were standing around. And I walk up, and they're all standing around. And I start standing there with them, kind of in line, to clock out. But nobody's going to clock out. Why? We're riding the clock. That was just what they call it. I'm sure other people call that. You're riding the clock. Basically, you're just sitting around. You're not working, but you're getting paid to work. That's not doing justly. We should do right by God. When we come to church... We should praise Him. We should worship Him. Why? Because it's due unto His name. That's doing justly. It's doing right. I better move on. Listen, I've got to preach until it quits raining anyway, right? Big amen. Right? Come on, help me now. I'm going to preach until it quits raining. And uh, then, then, you know, then we can go on. So the first command is to do justly. Secondly, He tells them to love mercy. Love mercy. Mercy is this. Mercy is the tenderness of heart that causes you to treat someone better than they deserve. Right? Mercy is when you don't get something bad that you do deserve. Grace is when God gives you good things that you don't deserve. So mercy is, mercy is punishment withheld. It's mercy requires an offender. You can't give mercy, you can't... Give mercy to someone who's not an offender, who's not guilty. And so, so he's saying we should love mercy. Something that's interesting in these two commands, all right? You have do justly, and then you have love mercy. I want you to think about this with me, all right? If you can, if you can over, uh, listen over the rain. There are two contradictions in these two statements, apparent contradictions. Do justly. That's justice, right? You have love, mercy. That's mercy. You have justice and mercy. Now, those, most people would think that that's a contradiction. If someone gets justice, that means that they didn't get mercy. Does that make sense? Please say yes. Does that make sense? If someone gets justice, that means they didn't get mercy. They got what they deserved. And, and then there's another kind of difference and distinction. One is to do, do justly. And the other one is to love mercy or to desire mercy. What, this, what I believe this is saying is this. I think he's saying you should expect justly or justice from yourself and you should desire mercy for others. Amen. When he says love mercy, that's not a command for you to enjoy it when you get mercy. Everybody loves it when they get mercy. Isn't that sad? Everybody wants mercy for themselves, but wants justice for everybody else. But that'll help you if you get a hold of it. Everybody, everybody wants mercy for them, but then everybody else should get justice. Well, this verse is saying is no, it should be the opposite. Right? We should, we should desire that we do justly. And we should love to see other people experience mercy. And we should love to extend mercy to other people. That's what he's saying. Jesus gives a, a, a parable later on in, in Matthew chapter number 18. I'm not going to make you turn there, but in Matthew 18 it talks about uh, this man who, own, who owes 10,000 talents and, 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 and then he's forgiven. He's brought before the guy that he owes. The guy forgives him. And then that same guy who's forgiven of that great debt, he goes out in the street and he finds somebody else that owes him a hundred pence. And he takes him by the collar, right? And he says, you need to pay me what you owe. And he says, please give me time. And the guy has, the, has him thrown into jail. He was just forgiven of 10,000 talents. And then he won't even forgive this other guy a hundred pence. You know what he's saying? Mercy for me and justice for thee. You should get what you deserve while I walk off scotch-free 
for all the wrong that I've done. Listen, I, I, I think we all need mercy. Amen? It's not just something that we need for ourselves. Listen, we, we, I, will, I love to see mercy in the life of other people. I got a whole lot of mercy when I got saved. Amen? I mean, I got a whole lot of love. I, I, I was forgiven of a great debt, and I love to see other people forgiven of debts. I love to see other people come to Christ and be saved from their sin. And sadly, I think we live in a world of people who don't love to see mercy in other people's lives. I've heard preaching along those lines. People say, well, you know what? Those, uh, that, that crowd out there, well, they're going to hell, and, and, they'll, and they'll talk about it as if it's a, a wonderful thing. Yeah, you, yeah, they're just going to die and fry, and they'll laugh about it. That is wicked. That's not loving mercy. I don't want to see anybody go to hell. I deserve to go to hell, and so I don't want to see anybody else go to hell. I love mercy. I love to see, see, see God give somebody else a second chance because I've needed a second chance and a third chance and a fourth chance in my life. I've needed it, and because I've needed it, I, I want to give that to other people. You say, well, they're going to take advantage of you. Who cares? We're, we're, we're supposed to be sharing the love of Christ, right? We're supposed to be kind, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Again, we, we forgive others for Christ's sake. You know why God forgave you? You know why God forgave me? For Christ's sake. Not for my sake. Not because I deserved it. For Christ's sake. You know why you should forgive other people? For Christ's sake. Jesus died for them. Jesus loves them. They may be different than you. They may come from a different place. They may have a different background, a different experience in their life. But God loves them. Amen. And God's willing to have mercy on them. I believe it's Romans chapter 11 says that He will have mercy on all. And how dare you and I, sinful men, refuse mercy to people that God would love to give mercy to? How can we approach God? Well, we're going to have to do justly, and we're going to have to love mercy. Lastly, this is what God requires. Do justly, love mercy, and then he says to walk humbly with thy God. An entire message could be spent on this subject of, of walking humbly with God. I'm just going to say this, a few things quickly. Walking humbly, he's speaking of our lifestyle, right? It, it, it's, it's our manner of life. What he's saying is... That humility should characterize our relationship with God. Humility. Think about John 3.30. Everybody knows John 3.30, right? He must increase, but I must decrease. The best way to think about that verse, that verse is a scale. It's a scale. Meaning you have you on one side and God on the other side. When he, says that, when he says that he must increase, but I must decrease, he's saying God can't increase unless I decrease. Does that make sense? It's a scale. You have to decrease in order for God to increase. It's not going to happen any other way. And yet, a lot of Christians live their entire lives trying to increase. Right? I want to be great. I want to be known. I want to be popular. I want to have power. I want to have wealth and position. I want to be elevated above other people. Amen. That's what, that's what they're searching for. That's what they're longing for. I want to be esteemed as better than somebody else. There are churches that operate that way. Our, our entire purpose for existing is to be better than the other church down the road. That's not right. That's not walking humbly with God. That's walking arrogantly with yourself. I, I, mean, I get tired of it. People go on, on the internet and on Facebook and try to paint their church as this, the best church around and better than everybody else's church. Churches that start off saying, welcome to our place. We're the best church in the plant, on the planet. We're the best church there is. That's a terrible attitude. When, when you say best... Somebody has to win and somebody has to lose. Meaning we're better than them. And our entire purpose for existence is to be better than somebody else. That is not walking humbly with God. That's arrogance. It's sin. It's not pleasing to God. 
You have to humble yourself. You must decrease in order for Him to increase. It has to happen that way. You say, I want God to increase in my life. You're going to have to have a much lower opinion of yourself. Amen? The best Christians that I know think they're the worst Christians. Is that not the case? The best Christians that you know, if you were to talk to them and tell them, you know what, I just think you're such a great Christian, I mean, they would blush. Right? They would kind of slump down. they say, well, no, I, you, know, you don't really even know me. I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm wicked. I just thank God for saving me. Right? Isn't, isn't that right? And it's not fake. It's not a put on. They, they really feel that way. Why? Because in their mind, they have decreased so low. It doesn't matter where anybody else puts them. They, they know where they are in relation to the holiness of God. And, in, and, and again, the, the, the converse or the inverse is the same. In order for Him to increase, you have to decrease. You say, well, how do, you, how do I decrease? He has to increase. When, when, you, when you open the Bible and you find out more about who God is, the more time that you spend with God, the greater He'll be in your life, and by necessity, the smaller you'll be in your life. We need, we need to be humble. Amen. I preached a message on this back uh, in November. I preached on why and how to be humble out of 1 Peter 5. He says, To humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time. How? That's a great question, right? How can I humble myself under the mighty hand of God? I've met people and known people that, that and, and, and a lot of times it's some young man, some young preacher, and, and they're just completely filled with pride. It just oozes out of them. It's, it's, it's seen in everything that we do. And, 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 and what I want to tell them is, here's how you can humble yourself. He tells us, casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. Prayer is the key to kill pride. It's, it's the only way. Through prayer, you can kill pride. Hopefully you would sit here and say, you know what, I've probably got a pride problem. I think we all could say amen right there. I mean, to a degree, everybody, we love to think well of us. We, all, we think a lot of ourselves. We're, we think we're capable. We think we're smart. We think we're better than everybody else. That's just, that, that's a human thing. You say, well, how can I fix that? You need to spend time with God in prayer. Listen, I said spend time with God in prayer. People argue, well, is it better to have quality or quantity time in prayer? The answer is yes. Yes. And yet I feel like most people do not spend any time in prayer. If you have a pride problem, that's why. Amen? If I have a pride problem, that's why. It, it, is, a, it, it is literally that simple. Listen, it's better for you to humble yourself than for you to wait and let God humble you. I think it's way better for you to humble yourself. Say, God, no, I'm going I'm to submit to you. I'm going to decrease. You're going to increase in my life. And the only way that we can accomplish that is by spending time in prayer, talking to Him. When you talk to somebody, you get to know who they are. Right? The more I talk with y'all, the more you spend time with me, the more we learn about each other. That's how this thing works. It's the same way with God. And if you and I don't spend any time with God in prayer, He's never going to increase, and we're never going to decrease, and we're not going to, we're not going to do what's required, and we're not going to be able to walk humbly with God. I've made this statement before, but pride will ruin, will ruin your praying, or praying will ruin your pride. It's, it's going to be one or the other. The reason people don't pray is because they're proud. You say, I'm not going to cast all my care upon him because I've got this. I've got it. I don't need God to help me with this. I've got this thing all figured out. My loved ones who need to be saved, I don't have to spend time praying for them. I've got this. That's pride, right? You say, well, what do I need to do to fix it? You need to pray. And that's going to take humility. That, that's, going to take, that's going to take crucifying your flesh because your flesh don't want to pray. We're about to have an altar of prayer here in just a minute. I'm going to go ahead and tell you, your flesh ain't going to want to pray. It is not going to want to pray. My flesh has never wanted to pray. 
You're going to have to pray in spite of your flesh. Amen? You're going to have to say, no, I, I am going, to, I must decrease. It's something that has to happen in my life. And when you look at these three things, doing justly and loving mercy and walking humbly, you, you, you can't have one without the others. It's a package deal. If you're not walking humbly, you're not going to love mercy. Right? You know, why, you know why somebody loves mercy? Because they know how much they've needed mercy in their life. That's humility. Right? You see that? You can't, you can't, you can't love mercy unless you're walking humbly. You're not going to be able to do justly if, if you don't love mercy and you're not walking humbly. All these things are connected together. They're connected together by, by one thing, and that is they're all matters of the heart. This guy's saying, well, should I give money? Should I, sac- should I shed blood? What, what, what does God want from me? He wants your heart. He wants you to love Him. He wants you to spend time with Him. He wants you to think highly of Him. In order to, in order to do that, we're going to have to humble ourselves. And me and Miss Alicia, if you'll move towards the piano, and, uh, let's all stand. Let's spend some time praying, asking for God to touch us and help us tonight. I preached till the rain quit. I told you that's what I was going to do. And uh, I'm going to spend some time praying, and I hope that you'll, that you'll do that as well. All right?